It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is April Falcon Doss, and we're going to be discussing her new book, Cyber Privacy, Who Has Your Data and Why You Should Care. April, it is truly an honor. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Sean. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. Well, April, this is the first time you and I are meeting today, and I know you are going to be brand new to like 99.9% of my listeners, my viewers. So let's kick off our conversation with a bit of what we might call the April Falcon Doss origin story. For somebody meeting you for the first time today, what do they need to know about you? Sure. Thanks for asking. So um, I'm a lawyer by training, and I got out of law school in the 1990s, did a lot of usual things. I I worked as a public defender. I worked at a law firm. Um, When the terrorist attacks of 9-11 hit our country in 2001, um, like a lot of people, I did sort of some stock taking around, you know, what seems important um, to me and and how can I do something that's, you know, sort of going to feel meaningful in the world. And so um, i I decided that if if there was an opportunity to use my legal training in a way that was in service to our nation, that that was an honorable thing to do. And um, so I went to work at the National Security Agency. I spent over a decade there. That's really where I learned about technology, about cybersecurity, about data privacy. And the more deeply I got immersed in it, the more those topics became areas that not only fascinated me, but that I discovered I was really passionate about. Um, That's how we get to where, where I am now, almost 20 years later, having spent about two decades really focused on these issues. And in terms of uh, going to school, growing up, what you wanted to be when you grow up, did you ever see yourself going in this direction? Oh, never. I had no idea. I mean, first of all, like cybersecurity wasn't a thing. And right. data privacy, those notions didn't really exist in that way. When I was growing up, there was no social media. We didn't all carry smartphones in our hip pockets. Um, and so these so this, these ideas around the intersection of technology and privacy were nowhere on my radar screen, so to speak. Um, I had just thought, well, you know, I, I, I like to learn about things. I like to write about things. I like to try to make sense of things. And, and going down the path of law seemed like a good way to do that. And I Truly, there was a lot of serendipity involved in sort of stumbling my way into a particular area of law that I discovered I cared about a lot. Well, and as a publishing guy, I'm always curious to hear where a book got its start. So in terms of this book, was there a catalyst? Or was there an aha moment where like, oh, I'm, I must write this? I'm always curious how a project came together. Yeah, so it's a great question. So um, back when I was still in government, um, I was, it was maybe 2015 or so, um, I was teaching a class. I was just giving a lecture to a bunch of uh, intelligence officers in the IC about what were the origins of privacy in America and and how does the government get um, restrained in in its ability to do certain things? I mean, what are are the restrictions to protect people's rights and so forth? And um, so I do this lecture and and, uh, afterwards, somebody comes up to me and says, that was such an interesting talk. You should really write a book about that. And, uh, and it was like this light bulb moment. I had actually um, always wanted to be a writer. If I had not gone to law school, if I had had, I don't know, a little bit more imagination, I probably would have pursued something like journalism or some other form of writing instead. And I thought, aha, maybe this is my chance. Um, so I thought, well, is there anything, any topic that I have some some familiarity with that, um, you know, that I could maybe contribute to the discussion on. And so it was really, it was that, that spark of a moment after teaching a class one day when I thought, well, you know, if, if, if some people are interested, maybe more people are interested, maybe a book could be a good thing to put out in the world. Well, I think uh, the more we can expose a, a wider audience to these sorts of topics, it only helps. I, I feel like people Uh, just don't even understand how much of their data is out there in the world, so to speak. We'll we'll get to that in a little bit, though. Um, So, you know, we're in this time where we're hyper-connected, I would say over-connected. I mean, you just mentioned people having smartphones everywhere they go. We're sharing all of our personal data on social media right now, it seems. Um, But in terms of just having an expectation for a reasonable amount, a decent amount of privacy, is that unrealistic or is it still okay for us to have some 
some want of a, a little bit of privacy, uh, kind of a line not yet to be crossed? That is such a great question. That's such an important question. I, I think not only is it reasonable, I think it's essential for us to still be able to maintain a sense of privacy. And one of the things that's so challenging, I think, is, is, is just that foundational question. When we say privacy, what do we mean? Because there's so many dimensions to it. So sometimes when we talk about privacy, what we really mean is the, the right to be le left alone, to not have people intrude on our our space, whether that's in our homes or in our conversations or in our lives. Sometimes we're talking about the right to be anonymous, the right to walk down the street without, you know, having facial recognition cameras record us and put that into a database that gets, you know, that lasts forever. Um, we want to be able to, to do things without having our actions tracked and memorialized. Sometimes we're really talking about a sense of autonomy and personhood and um, the, the right to be able to sort of have our own free expression in the world and take in ideas without, without having people try to influence us based on sort of the unfair advantage of personal profiling based on our data, you know? And, um, and, and sometimes we mean things like, what sometimes is called the right to be forgotten, the right to live down all of the mistakes that we've made in our past. Um, I'm grateful that there wasn't any social media when I was a teenager. You know what I mean? Like things live on the internet forever and it's very hard to, to move beyond past mistakes. So there's all these different dimensions of privacy. All of them are important. And, um, and to your point, the way that we live today with this very connected world um, does create risks to all of those dimensions. And I think it makes it more important than ever that we really think clearly about what kinds of privacy matter most to us as individuals and as a society and how we protect and preserve those, even in this really connected, constantly online world that we all live in today. Yeah, I, I want to pull on a thread of what you just said a little bit ago, and that's this idea that the internet is forever you know, whether we're talking about Wayback Machine or Internet Archive or different different things, you know, and even iterations of our websites are preserved in different places on the web. And that's just a few things that are more public facing, let alone if you understand the inner workings of what's happening behind the scenes in terms of every place you visited, all that is in a database somewhere at, at your internet service provider. So in terms of the amount of data that's collected, both that's visible and kind of invisible, uh, it's it's just growing, growing, growing every day. And you know, and the other thing I wanted to comment on too is in terms of shaping the experience, you know, as somebody who works in marketing for a living and helping authors get the word out about their books, you know, we do things that shape the traffic and we pay money to have other people see the things that we want them to see, you know, things that are like other things they've bought or based on other preferences. And so, uh, you know, I think in the moment we aren't always actively thinking about it, but our experience on the web is very much shaped by money and uh, data and all kinds of things. Uh, so it's not just this pure internet experience, maybe what it was <laughs> 10, 15, 20 years ago, so to speak. It's, it's much more curated for us, uh, yeah. at least it seems in, in the time that we're in right now. Uh, one funny thing I, or one funny thought I had as I was preparing for this interview was um, all the end user license agreements. I think of how many thousands of those I've just scroll, 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 accept, great, and just click through without ever really reading what any of it says. So uh, I, I thought it might be fun to have you comment on when we fail to read the license agreements and we just blindly accept, what are we unknowingly agreeing to? Yeah, it's a great question. It's such an important one. Um, and somebody did a study at one point that uh, concluded that the average person, based on the number of apps and platforms and accounts that we all have, if we were to sit down and carefully read every single one of those agreements before we click I accept, it would take like 75 days to read them all. So of course nobody reads them, um, or certainly nobody reads all of them. And, um, and, and what gets buried in those is typically um, an explanation of who information can be shared with, how long it will be kept, and what it can be used for. And those are really kind of the key, the, the three key areas. And, you know, you were talking about sort of this, this massively connected world we live in. And if you think about it, you know, Facebook first came online in 2004. 
It's, it's less than 20 years old. The first smartphone was the iPhone in 2007, less than 20 years old. Now we have co continuous precision geolocation um, at all times when we have our phones with us. And um, platforms like Facebook are, are one of those areas where you see the most data sharing. And so to your question specifically around all these end user license agreements and so forth, if I download a new app uh, on my phone, for example, it will typically ask me to give permission for sharing with partners, which is often not very clearly defined. Um, and it will tell me what it wants to share. And it might ask, for example, for permission to access my location information from my cell phone. It might ask for permission to access my photos or my contacts, or my microphone, or my camera. It might ask for permission to access data from my other apps. It might ask for permission to access um, all of my online search history every time I Google something. Um, and it might ask for permission to gather data from my other devices. So an app on my phone might ask for permission to gather data from my use of my computer at at home. And so those are the kinds of things to be mindful of because it's not that there's anything inherently nefarious about this. To your point, um, marketers do use this information to give us suggestions for things that we're likely to be interested in. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, the risk is that we sometimes give away far more access to information than we intended to. And um, one, of the, one of the recent instances in which that became very controversial was uh, in 2017, when news reporting started coming out about um, the role that the consulting company Cambridge Analytica had in sharing data from Facebook users. This was all for uh, purposes of election campaigns in the 2016 election. Um, Cambridge Analytica used an app that gathered data from, uh, I don't know, a, a small number of users, um, a couple of hundred thousand. But it requested permission to access information about all of those users' friends on Facebook. And through that, instead of getting information about just a few hundred thousand who explicitly gave permission, it got information about 87 million people who had not given permission. And um, those are the kinds of terms that get buried in these in these um, license agreements. These are absolutely things that we have control over if we're paying attention and if we know what to look for. Um, but it's, it's important Right now we have to pay attention and look for them. Um, otherwise it's, it's far too easy to be caught unawares and, and realize that we've given away information we never intended to share. Well, I think often in the terms of like a free app, uh, the cost probably outweighs any kind of a benefit that you might be uh, receiving from it. I remember back in the day, there were a bunch of flashlight apps for smartphones and all it did was turn on your, your light for your camera. But when you started picking apart the permissions you gave those apps, it was like, okay, literally, this is supposed to just turn on my camera, and not give you access uh, to all of my data. I feel like there is a distinction, though, between like, end user license agreements, maybe for software on my laptop or my Mac or whatever versus what's on my phone, because there's a totally different uh, type and amount of data on the phone. I mean, think of how much with the phone, you, you have every place I visit every number I've called a lot of times people have credit cards tied to their smartphones and just your whole life kind of exists on the phone almost in a way it maybe existed on your computer 10 or 15 years ago. So um, in terms of when something's free, you're the product, how concerned should we be when, because we're, we're all putting free apps on our phone and we really have no idea what we're giving away. And maybe you've maybe kind of already answered that, but I feel like there's a distinction to be made. It's far more risky with the phone today, I think, even than what we're doing on our computers. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. And yeah, that that old that old Silicon Valley adage: if you're not the product, if you're not paying for the product, you are you the are. product. <laughs> yep. It really is true. And you know, one of the ways that we see that play out is um, in some of the free services like Facebook and YouTube, um, all of the social media platforms. Some of what we see is that because the product is free. Um, access to Facebook and all of the connectedness that that enables, be, uh, access to YouTube and all of the content that's available. Because the, the product 
is provided without cost. Um, the business model is all about serving up advertising that that the platforms think an individual user is going to be attracted to. And, and the really sort of um, most corrosive kind of effect of this is around the incentives to keep people on screen. And so there's been a lot of work done looking at the ways that these social media platforms really try to Keep, keep your screen on the eye, your eyeballs on screen, right? Um, user engagement is how they get their money because you're not buying a product from them directly. And you know the old saying, another old Silicon Valley saying, if it enrages, it engages. And so what that does is it creates an incentive for the algorithms to look for what is the content, news content, videos, media, memes, all of those things that is most likely to cause a particular user to be angry, fearful, outraged, or have one of those very strong negative emotions. There's all this research showing that people react more intensely to negative emotions than to positive ones. And so this really um, sort of divisive and polarized conversation that we've gotten into around many kinds of political issues is partly driven by the way that our personal data is used um, because um, by enraging people, it keeps them on the platform, engaging with new advertising, and it's more profitable. So when you're talking about companies, whether it's a device or an app or a software, you know, suite of some kind for a computer, when you're talking about something that you literally are paying cash money for, right? There was a price to that product. Um, typically, you're giving up less personal data because the way that that company remains profitable is you pay a purchase price and it's very straightforward. It's those free services where the way the business model is around using our data to make us do something, to keep us in the app longer, keep us scrolling through our feeds longer, keep us clicking on these products or shaping our opinion, not just presenting us information, but trying to influence us very directly. Um, that's where it's it's um, the greatest risks are. And one of the, I think, core challenges to that is we really don't have a good way of, of describing what privacy is worth. And so there's been a lot of really interesting work done showing that, you know, we collectively, most people say, yeah, privacy is important. But when it really comes down to brass tacks, what would you be willing to pay if you had to, to have better control of your data? Um, there's really not any good answers for that. And so um, right now, most of us very often give away data without really thinking it through very carefully first. Yeah, I think in, in terms of social media, um, the pressure is to be wherever our friends, our family, our relationship, where people are in relationship, wherever they are, that's where we want to be on the web. And generally, those are quote unquote free services. So e even if you wanted to have an alternative option, if everybody that you want to communicate is already heavily using those free services, so to speak, well, that's probably where uh, you're going to want to hang out this year uh, and going forward. You know, I, in terms of like shaping content that you you see. Uh, I think this was a, a great year for somebody to look back and do some case studies because I think of different friends who I've talked to about what they've seen in their social media streams and news feeds in different places this past year. You know, I could put a friend who has a uh, died in the wool Democrat and a staunch Republican side by side and ask them about their experiences on social media. And they saw completely different news in terms of just yeah. what what people experienced this year, especially it was mark, markedly day and night different in a way I don't feel like we've uh, ever seen in the past, which uh, was kind of surprised me the level that it was uh, to this year. Uh, but I, I want to redirect this in a slightly different direction because that's a, a different a rabbit hole we could go down if we kept going that direction. Um, in terms of like really intrusive use of data this year, you gave us that example from the 2016 election. But you know whether it's something pulled from the headlines in 2020, like what's maybe the worst breach or you know kind of sketchy use of data that comes to mind as you think about this year. Yeah, well, I'll give you two answers from different contexts. One is in this 
sort of commercial data context that we've been talking about, um, you know, I think a lot of women who use uh, fitness and fertility and family planning apps were really surprised to discover that information about when they had their periods and whether they were trying to conceive was getting shared with Facebook. Um, that was one of those things. It wasn't a data breach. It was one of those things built into the permissions of the app. And most of those women who found out thought, wait a minute, I thought this data lived on my phone and I was using it for my personal purposes. And this is really sensitive information. So that's one kind of example. Um, very different um, context. Um, as we have all been living through, you know, the pandemic and remote learning and work and things like that, um, a growing number of employers and schools have been using very uh, sort of privacy intrusive, frankly, technologies to keep an eye on what their employees and students are doing at home. So we see employers um, who have some of their workforce working remotely requiring their workers to be not just logged in from home doing work, but on camera so that the employer can have somebody sort of watching through the camera to see, are you paying attention all the time? Or perhaps having keystroke loggers and things like that to, um, to do a level of surveillance of employees that has not traditionally been done. It's sort of, it's sort of a greater sense of intrusiveness. Similarly with students, with so many students around the country learning remotely, um, you know, we're seeing a real rise in things like um, remote proctoring software for students taking exams where a student is sitting down at, you know, in front of an iPad or at a desktop computer and, you know, in their family kitchen or whatever, and they're trying to take a test and they're trying to focus on that work that's in front of them and meanwhile, they have somebody recording them as they're sitting there taking the test and, and watching their every move. Um, in both cases, these are intended to prevent some kind of misfeasance, right? Prevent cheating by the student or prevent the, um, the worker from, you know, just sort of goofing off and playing solitaire all day, I guess, you know. But it's a level of privacy intrusion that really is only made possible by these technologies. Um, and that, again, I think kind of socially, culturally, we haven't really grappled with yet. What do we think should be the limits on those kinds of uses? Next, I'd like to talk about what happens when our data gets outside of the United States. I mean, it's it's super hard to conceive of because I think of all the different software I use on a daily basis and the apps I use. Many of those companies aren't even here in the United States or their servers are elsewhere in the world. You know, for the average person who gets web hosting for just their personal website or their business website, a lot of times those don't exist on servers here in the United States. So um, in terms of data privacy, data sharing, data harvesting outside of the United States, are things better or worse? Well, I would say they're different. <laughs> um, so and, and it's a great question because most of these big technologies and platforms are international and the capacity and data always has the, the ability to travel around the world. So it really does matter. Um, so there's really sort of three buckets I would put countries in. Um, the European Union is uh, probably the most protective of individual data rights. They have a law called the General Data Protection Regulation that applies to all of the countries in the European economic area. And it protects the residents in those areas from having their data collected. There's a higher threshold for giving consent and for how data can be used and shared and so forth. Um, so, so that's sort of the most privacy protective region. And there's a few other countries around the world that have followed that model. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you have countries like Russia and China, where there's really heavily intensive government surveillance over the entire populace. There are legal requirements that all information about um, individuals in China and Russia who are using things like social media and cell phones and internet, um, that all that data be stored in those countries specifically so that the government can access it for surveillance purposes. And in China, um, there is this um, fascinating and perhaps dystopian sort of social credit framework in which individuals get a, a social credit score, kind of like we have a, an economic credit score, but it includes things like um, whether or not uh, you've made a post on social media that's viewed as 
um, inappropriate somehow, whether, whether a, a street light camera um, caught you jaywalking, right? Those things count as dings against your social media. It's very intrusive surveillance state. Um, so between these two extremes of sort of the, the protective European Union model and the sort of very surveillance heavy government activity in Russia and China, um, what you have in the US is something in the middle. We protect lots of kinds of data, um, but not all kinds. For example, to the point about the, the health-related apps sharing data with Facebook, we protect health data if it's held by doctor's offices and hospitals under HIPAA. We don't protect it if it's in a fitness app. Um, we just we, our, our laws just aren't modernized yet to do that. Um, we certainly have some government surveillance programs, law enforcement, national security, all have the ability to access certain kinds of personal data. But we have a constitutional framework and a bunch of statutes that restrict how that gets done. So, um, so really, it varies widely. And one of the things that's so interesting right now is that countries around the world really are looking to each other's examples to decide what might be appropriate to adapt and incorporate in you know, in other nations. And a lot of that work is really um, being, if not embraced by the technology sector, at least the tech sector is very open to that now because so many tech companies are subject to laws in multiple countries um, that they are starting to see the benefit of having some greater degree of maybe standardization or at least consistency around the world. Well, I think that makes me want to jump ahead a question and ask about laws and policies as, as we go forward. Because um, one example, and this is, isn't quite an apples to apples comparison, but in terms of Facebook and Twitter and kind of censorship, are they a publisher? Are they not a publisher? Trying to figure out how laws apply to these social media companies, you know, laws that were written in some cases like 50 years ago is really confusing because the laws never ever imagine that they would be applied in the day that we're in uh, to a large degree. And I, I would expect that security and privacy laws also struggle to uh, deal with the issue, just the unknown issues that we face today. So um, as we look ahead to the future, is there hope on the horizon for how law and policy can deal with the, and as we've talked about, just the myriad of challenges that are before us in trying to keep what should be private, private? Yeah, well, I think that, so I think there is hope on the horizon. Um, and, uh, and it's one of the things that I touch on in the book and in, in, the, in the later chapters is some of the ways that those laws and policies can get modernized because technology just changes so much more rapidly. And that innovation is a good and positive thing, but it changes so much more rapidly than law and policy do. Um, some of what we've seen is we've seen uh, some of the aspects of that European model adopted by California in the California Consumer Privacy Act, which applies to 40 million Americans to increase the scope of their rights um, with respect to privacy. There's a lot of momentum for a federal data privacy um, law of some kind. Um, this is a bipartisan momentum. Um, I mean, as you can imagine, different congressmen and senators have different views on what exactly that law might include. But we've really seen in the last couple of years a much greater interest in trying to create some sort of comprehensive federal privacy law that could try to address some of these issues and hopefully get written in a way so that the law's principles endure even as the specifics of the technologies change. Well, uh, as we begin to wrap up here, I guess I want to bring it down to like the more personal level in terms of the average person on the street. What can they do to take uh, some measures to protect their cyber privacy? Uh, obviously, they can get educated. They can read books like yours. but uh, any practical tips or tricks you might throw out to help people uh, move forward in a more secure way? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the, the place to start is with, with your smartphone. Um, whether you've got an Android or an, or, or an iPhone, look in those settings and, and take a look for all of your apps. What permissions have you given them? Um, do all of your apps need your real-time geolocation? You might want to turn off location services for all of those. Do they all need access to your mic? Do they all need access to your camera? Do they need access to your contacts? Going through the list of 
apps that you've got on your phone and just seeing what their permissions are is not terribly time consuming or burdensome. Similarly, if you've got um, home uh, digital assistants like, you know, the Amazon Echo or, you know, other kinds of devices, just be aware of where do you have that in your house? Know that those digital assistants are always listening. That's how they hear their wake word. Know whether or not you have the settings um, set so that it can or can't record you in the background. You have the ability to make those changes. So um, those are the, the simple um, sort of nuts and bolts ways to try to um, do sort of a, 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 a privacy health check, if you will, and see where you are right now and, and what changes you might want to make, depending on what kind of data privacy concerns you have. Um, again, none of this is, is inherently... Um, it's not that the, these. It's not that the these technologies are inherently bad, or that the data sharing is inherently wrong. It's a question of what are we as individuals comfortable with, and what do we want to reach out to our legislators at the state and federal level about to say, you know, I really think it should be harder for companies to do this. I think there should be greater consumer control over that, so that we can all maintain those essential um, those essential components of privacy in our lives. And April, for the listeners, the viewers who'd like to connect with you, find out more about the book, where can we discover you on the web? So I have a website, aprilfdos.com. And uh, there's more information about the book there. And most of the content that I post, I post on Twitter. So my Twitter handle is at aprilfdos. And you'll see me posting there regularly about data security, privacy, and, and related issues. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes places where you can connect with April and pick up your very own copy of her new book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with April Falcon Dawes. Once again, our book today was Cyber Privacy, Who Has Your Data and Why You Should Care. Again, if you want to find out more, a great place to start is April's website. You can find that at aprilfdaws.com. And April, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been a joy. It's been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you, Sean. It's been a real pleasure.